So, welcome to everybody. Um, this is Startup Grind and this is Itzanami Martinez. So let's start with uh, Itzanami. Please help me to applause. Here or there? Uh, here. Okay. Yeah. Let's start uh, from, from the beginning. So okay. tell us who is Itzanami, where are you from, uh, your background. Um, okay, well, I'm, um, I'm an entrepreneur. Since I was 18 years old, um, I, I studied, I, was, I used to live in a very, very small city in the south of Spain. And I wanted to study- Which city? El Puerto de Santa Maria in Cadiz, mm -hmm. like the real south of Spain. And I, want, I, I, I wanted to be a ballerina uh, when I grew up, uh, but I used to dance ballet for a lot of years. So we moved cities and I had to leave the, the studio I, and my artistic career died. So I didn't know what to do with my life and I decided to study anthropology. And I had to study it in, in a distance university. So I had a lot mm -hmm. of free time. And when I have a lot of free time, I become really annoying. <laughs> so I said, okay, if I still want to have friends and a life, I need to do something with it. And I opened a dance and yoga studio. Nothing digital, nothing startup, scalable, mm -hmm. traction, mm -hmm. nothing like that. But it did, um, it did gave me like the virus of doing things on my own. And after that, I, I've been unable to work for anybody. I think mm -hmm. that the longest experiment was two months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so that was your first entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. let's say, experience. Also, if it wasn't tech, but still, you yeah. know, it's your, it was your project. So how did you end up uh, start working for Rocket Internet, for example? Mm -hmm. I mean, from studying humanities, anthropology, having your yoga center <laughs> to well, when I graduated from anthropology, I was 25 years old, and I got like a life crisis. I it was like, okay, I'm a quarter of, uh, how do you say siglo in English? Uh, siglo? Century. century. Okay, I'm, you know, quarter of a century, and I'm living in a very nice but very, very small town. And, you know, I'm doing nothing of what I wanted to do when I grow up. So I decided to sell the yoga center and move to Madrid. And here I studied for a year an MBA in fashion and luxury business because I wanted to work in fashion. I haven't worked in fashion yet, but I really, really loved it. And after finishing the, the MBA, Rocket Internet sent the offer to launch Glossy Box in Spain to my uh, business school and I applied and they select me. And then, you know, I was in love with doing things by myself. And then I met the digital world and then I become uh, crazy forever. There's no turning back. Mm -hmm. And what were you, were you doing uh, for Glossy Box? Uh, do you guys know Glossy Box? Anyone? Any customer? Okay, <laughs> you do? But you weren't a customer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, Glossy Box is a subscription model uh, of cosmetic samples. So customers, mainly women, but we had men too, they received every month a box with a selection of samples of cosmetic products. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a great business model and work at working for Rocket Internet is like way more useful than doing an MBA or even studying at college. You mm -hmm. know, six months working for those people makes you like a killing machine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's but it can also drive you nuts. I don't know anyone who has lasted more like one year and a half working yeah. for, for Rocket Internet. But I, I learned a lot. And I learned that the subscription model was a great business model, uh, but that the cosmetic sector was not the best fit for it. So mm -hmm. I started to investigate and I realized that the baby market uh, would be a great market to apply that that business model, mm -hmm. and that's how Nona Box was so, yeah. was born. So you were a country manager in uh, Glossy Box, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. And how was the experience as country manager? Uh, in a now what? Yeah, project that is not yours, you know. So it's 
great. I, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur because I have uh, problems with authority. It's just that uh, when you you have bosses anytime, I and mean, if you're an entrepreneur and you raise money, uh, an investor is more of a boss than a real boss because mm -hmm. it's someone that has given you tons of millions of euros, and that puts you closer to that person that with a b you can't quit. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's. It's great. It's just, you know, you take an idea, you execute it. Because to me, the magic of being an entrepreneur is not to have great ideas, but to execute mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, okay, so then after y your real entrepreneurial journey started, mm -hmm. no, with not a box. Mm -hmm. So you, get, you, you were saying you got the idea from the subscription model of mm -hmm. Rocket Internet and applied to another sector, let's say, another target, mm -hmm. more than, and uh, so what, what made you say, okay, I'm gonna do it, like, okay, ha probably you had this idea, but then what make you st start? Mm, not knowing how hard it was going to be, <laughs> probably. Okay. <laughs> you know, there is a, a phrase that I really love, which is, they did it because they didn't know it was impossible. And, you know, the older you get and the more startups you launch, you're more effective, but at the same time, you're less brave. And on the first one, two startups, you believe you can do almost anything. And that feeling makes you almost get it, almost do it. So with Nona Box was like, come on, this can be so difficult. <laughs> just, you know, just go try and, and do it. And I'm so glad we did, really, really glad. Mm. And also, you know, it was a very good business idea and the business pitch was like, hey, we've just launched this business model in this market for Rocket Internet with these results and now we want to do the same thing in another market. So getting investment was fairly easy and that gave us, you know, the kick to, mm -hmm. to really start. So Rocket Internet was a good... Uh, Definitely, uh, yeah. Credential to yeah, <laughs> for <was>. the investors, <laughs> no? Uh, so how d how did you start? Well were, y were you alone? Were, were you I with someone else? I launched it, in fact, with my ex-husband. <laughs> um, yeah, we, I, I, we were playing with the idea, and, you know, Luis Caviedes, that I knew he was a guy who knew things about internet, but I had no idea he was one of the main venture capital in Spain at the time. He was my entrepreneurship teacher at the MBA. So I was playing with the idea and I say, hey, this guy knows about internet. I'm gonna <laughs> call him and have a coffee with him. But just, you know, to see mm -hmm. if he can help me. Yeah. Uh, but I had no idea that I was about to start raising money. And I s sat down with him, I started to tell the idea, all what, hi why what I have learned at Glossybox, and he told me, sounds great, present me a business plan in two days. So I went back home and I say to Ramon, my ex-husband, you're not going to believe what just happened. You know, it's like amazing. So we spent two days searching through my the papers of the MBA because I didn't remember how to do uh, business, business plan. <laughs> to give you an idea, I had no idea how to add numbers in Excel at that time. <laughs> now I can do macros. I'm so <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> but you know, I, I was it was you know I studied Latin, Greek, history, all those things. So to me to do a financial projection in ten years was like what? <laughs> okay, so the MBA uh, helped a bit. Yeah, it, it helped. It helped in but I sense. wasn't, you know, ready enough. We worked for two days, I present uh, the business plan in uh, that Friday. And I still keep that presentation and that business plan. And I really recommend you to keep your first, you know, business plans or presentations because they're going to be hideous and really unbelievable. And when you go back to them five years after, you're going to be, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it helps you see, you know, how far you have growed. So we were asking for 150,000 euros. And Caviedes, they're very pragmatic and they say, great, we're gonna give you 40K and you have three months to launch the website, get the first customers and fill the first 5,000 boxes. Because the key of the discovery boxes model is that you get the products from, from free 
from the brands in exchange of marketing actions and you sell them to the customers. So you're basically selling what you get for free, which gives you great margins. And as it's a subscription model, you get a lot of recurrence from, from customers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Cavides was like, I cannot believe that you can get 5,000 products for free from brands. So this was that same Friday, 4 a.m., they sent the email. On Monday, Ramon and I, we both quit our jobs. And, you know, we had no kids, no mortgage, no nothing. And we were like, okay, if this doesn't work, the worst thing that can happen to us is we go back to El Puerto Santa Maria and live in front of the beach. It's not that bad. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really, I really, you know, I really admire people who, with kids and a mortgage that, you know, they have the guts to, to do it. But in our case, it was a fairly easy decision. Uh, this was Monday. Uh, on Wednesday, we constitute the, um, the company. company. We went to IKEA. We bought a big uh, table. I take. I took two two employees from from Glossybox, and we started working. Mm -hmm. So three months after, we launched the website, and I did something that I'm not doing ever again, which was launching the website live on an event with press and bloggers and everything. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I know that it works one out of 20 times. Yeah, when that, you that was the one. <laughs> and it worked, but you know, I still remember the IT guys looking at me like, you're crazy. How are we going? And I was like, yeah, you press the button and it goes up, right? And they were like, yeah, but it can, no, 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 no. and it worked. Uh, <laughs> I won't do it ever, ever again, but that time it worked. We filled the first 5,000 boxes, and we got our first 18 customers. Mm -hmm. Seven of them were friends. But, you know, we got Still. unknown people that trusted us and, and bought our boxes. And that was how, how it started. Okay. And uh, so, okay, so it's not easy, but the first fund, the first round, it's... Uh, easier than the second one probably because then you have to really demonstrate no, that your idea, your business mm -hmm. model is validated? Not real because the second round was that um, Caviedes, they, they were true to their word and they gave us the 110 left that mm -hmm. they promised, which in the best VC world is not that common. So, you know, what I last like most about Caviedes and Partner is that, you know, if they give you their word, you can trust that. And that's not very common. No, no, no. Uh, but the problem was the third round. Mm. The third round came way too quick. They gave us way too much money. And we started doing things way too quick. Mm -hmm. uh, we launched it on the 1st of March, 2012. And to give you an idea, on July, we already had a team and an office and a company in Italy. And in October, we had all the same things in, in Germany. And to me, the problem wasn't that we started to internationalize really quick. It made a lot of sense because our market was this big. We were selling to pregnant women and moms of babies up to one year old that had a medium-high acquisitive level mm -hmm. and that they bought to internet, which five years ago, which not, not that many so people. So we, we really needed to scale really quick and international lives really quick. That's why you, yeah. you start spamming exactly. so fast. But the big, big mistake, and um, I still can't come with a reason why no one realized it. We were a lot of intelligent people, you can say. But no one said, hey, if we're selling through internet, we don't need an office a company and a local team in each country. And that was the big mistake because we could be selling to Germany from Madrid with no problem, which yeah, we did course. afterwards. So in when we didn't even knew what our CPA was or CPL or customer life value, we had no idea of the basic metrics of our business. And we already had like three companies, three teams, three logistic partners, three providers of boxes. It was like a, a crazy. And the problem was not the money because, you know, if you have a sexy business model and you're cool, and it's quite easy to raise money. 
Somehow, the problem was that we lost one year and a half of business, business intelligence because we dedicated one year and a half on opening companies in six countries, opening offices, hiring teams, making that work, and then saying, oh shit, this is not working, I'm bringing everything back to Madrid. Yeah. So that year and a half, in 2014, we were like, okay, so what is our cost of customer acquisition in Germany? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> so it, it was a, a, a great setback. Uh, then we worked a lot and we gathered a lot of business intelligence and, and really got great met metrics, but we lost one year and a half of opportunity. Yeah. And which, I mean, in which country did you, did you expand? How, why did you choose them? Well, we launched Italy because one of the investors was Italian and he wanted to have it in Italy. That's the worst reason to launch a country. Uh, mainly because Italy, you know, when, when you're launching an online business and specifically when your market is so small, the percentage of people with credit cards that buy through internet, it's crucial. And at that time, Italy, online speaking, was not that, you know, they, they didn't have really high connection and people didn't pay with, with cards. So it was a very, very, very small market. Germany was a great decision, but for example, looking back, we should have launched France way before than the UK, because the UK is like 10 years behind, behind uh, af ahead. ahead, yeah, 10 years ahead. To give you an idea, our cost per lead in Spain, France, and Germany, which worked very similar, was of 40 cents, more or less, cost us to acquire an email, and in the UK was three pounds. Yeah, impossible. It was like no way to compete in that in that market. Okay, um, so uh, so let's say what made it successful. So what made the the business model work, and what made it fail? If we can say it, because at the end you 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 s you sell the company, right? Mm -hmm. So what were? Um, I think uh, it was a very good product. It was not a necessary product, but all the packaging and the storytelling we create around it was nice. And it was a business model where the value proposition for the brands and for the customer, the final customer, was very good. Mm -hmm. So I guess that when you have, we weren't really solving a crucial problem but we were giving something nice to both both parts, and I think that and it was very, very well executed. Mm -hmm. We became really, really good at marketing, digital marketing. Mm -hmm. We, at the end, created a marketing machine where we were able to acquire leads for 40 cents, convert a 4% of them, and multiply per four our marketing investment in two months. So we became very, very efficient on that. Mm -hmm. And what really killed us was choosing the wrong countries. Okay. Because at the end of the day, France, Germany, Austria, and Spain were working great. They had a lot of revenue. We were making uh, 1 million point five uh, million euros in revenue per year, which was nice. But Italy and the UK were getting <laughs> all that money and more to survive. So we ended up saying, okay, the only way to survive is to close Italy and the UK. But what, what happened? If we closed Italy and the UK, we stopped being investable, but we started being viable. Mm -hmm. And we were playing the game of grow, 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 and selling five years for 100 million euros. So playing, when you play that game, you're not supposed to be viable, you're supposed to be investable. And that made us, you know, no more funding coming. Mm -hmm. And so how was the selling process? How, when you, did you decide to do it and how was it? It was, it was a nightmare. It was a, a whole nightmare. Because 
we realized that and then we had an offer you know a guy who owned um, a diapers company wanted to buy us for 10 million and we were like okay so now it's not the right moment to close to countries because this guy wants to buy us because we we are in you know in all europe and it was a process of like four months negotiating the guy finally disappeared and four days, a four days after, we won a startup contest, and the prize was from one to five million euros investment for an invisible investor. We were like, okay, this sounds weird, but show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to complain. We met the, invest the invisible investor, and after another four months, the guy finally couldn't make it. So we had spent like the last eight months with no money for marketing, so metrics went <laughs> down. Yeah. Uh, we accumulated a lot of debt also. So we were in a very, very desperate situation. And at that situation, we weren't able to raise more money because we needed the money to pay debt and to close the UK and Italy to stay alive. And all the investors were like, hey, if I give you this money, you will never ever sell for 100 million euros, so I will never ever multiply by 10 my investment, so to me, it's better not to invest. And we decided to, to close, and we had a, like a very, very main, two main concerns. The first one was that uh, when you close a company in Spain, uh, you get like a judicial administrator, and this guy, he knows how to sell tables, uh, buildings, cars, and things like that. But this guy has no idea how to sell a database or what value has a brand in Facebook or Facebook fans or things like that. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the startups is that your main actives are not on your balance sheet. So we said, okay, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, debt. And this guy is not going to know how to make money out of the actives we have. Mm -hmm. So we started to try to sell Nona Box to literally everyone doing something with babies in Europe. Like I sent, I think we sent like 300 emails, 400. I don't know. I remember we were like five people, two weeks sending emails like crazy people. Mm -hmm. Like, we <laughs> <laughs> and one of them worked, mm -hmm. and we sold. Uh, what we had uh, to eShop here in Spain. And in fact, you can still buy Nona Box if you want. You know, the product is still working, which means that it was a good product, but maybe it wasn't scalable enough to become like the Not next so big yeah. startup to sell for 80 million euros or 100 million euros. Mm -hmm. And then the other main problem was um, the team. And we had a really, really international team. We were like 36 people, 11 nationalities, and people who four months before had left everything in the UK or Germany and came to Madrid to follow the Nonabox stream. So the idea to say to other people, hey, thank you for your sacrifice, we're closing, <laughs> was like really, really hard, really, really hard. So that's how the Nona team initiative Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please tell us more about it because I think it's a really nice. Yeah. It 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 was. Initiatives. Uh, it was the nice and sweet thing between the nightmare. Uh, we said, okay, guys, we're closing, but we have two weeks left of salary, and we're gonna make the best of them. So we created the Nona Team that ES page, uh, which I think we got. 80,000 visits or something like I don't know. It was like an online shop for the workers of Nonabox. So y we had a, a graphic design team uh, that made studio pictures to all the team. We reviewed all the LinkedIn profiles. We did like role playing in interviews. We moved it and in two weeks, the 80% of them found a job, which mm -hmm. was great. And in one month and a half, the hundred percent of the workers found great, great jobs. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was like, okay, th this adventure is finishing, but we're gonna live, you know, like putting okay. in value all that we have learned. Mm -hmm. Great. So anyway, after this experience, you mm -hmm. didn't give up because now you are with a new project. I tried. <laughs> I really tried. <laughs> but you, you, you show it because you're <laughs> yeah. doing it. So. 
So let's talk about your last baby, that okay. is Dr. 24. 24. So uh, new industry, new service. Mm -hmm. um, so why, why health? Uh, first of all, what is Dr. 24 for the ones who, who don't know it? How does it work? Uh, okay, it's, it's an e-health project. And right now we've built uh, an, an e-health platform that allows patients to connect with doctors and have a video consultation from anywhere, anytime, with no fuss and no, you know, not having to, to move and everything. Mm -hmm. So technologically, it's a very, very well-worked platform. And now we're finding, you know, where to monetize it and how to monetize it. And I ended up in e-health because, well, after Nona Box, I said, fuck it. I'm not, you know, I'm not launching a startup again in my life. <laughs> it, it normally happens. You say, like, hey, I would love to, you know, get a vacation, get sick, uh, get unemployment uh, subsidies yeah, somehow and, you know, mm -hmm. those things. And then I started, I worked for two months on an advertising agency. Oh, really? It's the funniest work I've ever, ever had. You know, I thought, you know, being an entrepreneur was really fun. No, go to work to an advertising agency. <laughs> you know, I, w we danced Sevillanas in the meetings. And oh, things wow. Like that. Well <laughs> What's the like name of the agency? <laughs> so maybe someone is interested. <laughs> MC Sachi. And ah, wait, but the wait. And, you know, it was a dream job. I, I, I was working with innovation, creativity, with great people. I had a lot of fun, but I needed to, you know, I, it was like two months. I smoked a lot. I was, you know, with anxiety. And I say, okay, I went to Google and said, okay, this is like a post-traumatic syn uh, syndrome. <laughs> it's normal. You know, I've been under a lot of stress with Nona Box. It will pass. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it, w it, it was wasn't. I, I was I was a junkie, uh. craving <laughs> my adrenaline. You know, mm -hmm. because when you launch something in Nona Box at the end, you know you save the day one out of five days. So that adrenaline rush was like you get addicted to it, mm -hmm. and it's not a good thing. But you know you get addicted to that. So when you have a nice, beautiful, and creative work the cravings come. Mm -hmm. So a guy comes to me and tell me, hey, I want to disrupt the e-health market. And I was like, I have no idea about e-health, uh, but sounds good, count with me. And you know, I, I jumped in with him, and it's great because he, this guy, he's a visionary, you know, he's like working for Elon Musk or something like that. And, and he really, believes that the e-health sector, it's, it's happening and there's a lot of things to do. And in the past year, I've become, I've, I've studied a lot and I know more that I wanted to know about, about health. Uh, but I really believe that, you know, startups and technology, they have disrupt sectors like uh, Airbnb, the, you know, lod lodging sector or Uber, the transporting sector. But health is way more important, and there's almost nothing. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a, a, a mission, and it, that's a great thing, because I'm substituting the adrenaline as a motivation with passion, mm -hmm. and it's way more healthy. Yeah. So, um, so what, are you, are uh, one, what are you doing for the lunch? How are you preparing? Um, we have done, uh, we are in beta right now, so what we're doing is to validate a technology which it's working pretty well, and we're also validating, you know, how the doctors are using the platform and how the patients are using it, because at the end, health is really complicated mm. and really delicate, yeah. because if you have an e-commerce, the worst thing that can happen is that you lose a box, okay? Yeah. Then you have a, pati a patient. <laughs> but here, you know, someone can die. Sounds like really mm, terrible, but it's true. It's, it's very, very delicate. Security-wise, it's amazing. Mm. And, and we're being very, very careful with those things. So right now we're like validating. And once we have everything ready, then we will we Okay. Will when do you think it's, uh, it's going to be the official? I guess September. Mm -hmm. Probably, but okay. you know, it it y you never know. It has a lot of uh, investigation mm -hmm. with it, 
and we there's a lot of uh, partners involved there's doctors there's patients there's associations there's so so it's been but i guess it's september Okay, but do you you don't have any competitors in Spain, right? You are the first ones to do something like that, mm. or some no, there not there direct are competitors. People doing doing a software that the one that we are making, but uh, I think we are different because we our usability is way better, and we think about a product, and they think more about a technology, and there's a lot of difference difference there. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so your target will be an, um, any kind of patients or like specific uh, kind of uh, specialties that your doctors will will offer, or it's going to be more generalist. It's going to be really generalist because the idea at the end, it's in Spain we have a very very big problem of unemployment in with the doctors, which is something that they make less way money than we thought. You know, an insurance company pays to a doctor for a consultation of 10 minutes about four to five euros. It is nothing. So they have to do like 60 consultations per day to make more money than a cleaning lady, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah. So it's a very, very complicated market. And also, those are the old doctors that do have a job, but from the doctors that are finishing their MIR, there is an employment rate of the 23%. Mm. And, you know, they, they have, like, really bad contracts with social security, and, you know, it's, it's, it's nasty. Mm -hmm. And that affects of on the quality of care. Mm -hmm. So the problem that you need to solve there is that you have a very poor access to good medicine, very low quality, and very high costs. And the only way to fix that it was I it's with e-health. The good thing is that in a lot of countries, this is working already, and there are a lot of data and a lot of metrics that validates this valid. model. So it's been quite easy to, to implement this in Spain, you know, with the backup of, hey, guys, in India, they're doing this way better than us, mm -hmm. and it's working great. Okay, cool. So, um, so in the meantime, you also uh, became the president of the Spanish Startup Association, mm -hmm. right? So you you seem really committed in helping other entrepreneurs. Yeah. And uh, so you are also mentors in, uh, in different accelerators. And so what are the typical mistakes that you see uh, in the startup you are mentoring? And I think the biggest uh, mistake that we all make um, I made it in Nona Box a lot of times, and in the past year with Dr. 24, I think I have already made it like two times more, is that um, you forget that your problem should be a solution to a real problem that a lot of people have. It's so easy to have an idea and to fall in love with it mm. and not validate it well enough with, with, you know, with your customer that we all make that mistake once and once and once again. So it's very typical when you <coughs> think that you are very representative, statistically relevant in the world, and if, that if you have that problem, then the rest of the market will have it. And you create a product for your problem or the problem of your group. And then that product, when you launch it, the, r the market is like, or you know the desert Going. balls mm -hmm. and 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 it's very hard and you be t you really need to be really really humble to say okay I, I've heard a lot of times no the market is not ready yet yes you know that worked for Steve Jobs <laughs> for example but we are not all Steve Jobs so norm normally the thing is that the market is not ready yet is that the problem that you're solving is not big enough or you're executing wrong the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the main mistake Thanks. we all make all the time. But would you, would you suggest for to these people, for example, to, to apply for an accelerator? Do you think that it can be really helpful because you actually didn't get any acceleration? I, I didn't. Um, it depends on the accelerator. 
of course. The, the thing with entrepreneurship is that now it's very cool to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, politicians, they used to kiss babies and now they kiss entrepreneurs. <laughs> and, you know, it's like being a rock star is very cool. And there's a lot of big companies that are saying, oh, yes, we do help entrepreneurs. And then they build a big thing and they put tables and Google style things and they say, we're helping the community. And there is a lot of bullshit around. There are a lot of great accelerators and great people helping entrepreneurs, but there is also a lot of people doing it for the picture or even worse, doing it to make money on expense of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So it's good that the ecosystem is growing really, really, really fast in Spain and we have a great ecosystem right now. But you know, when there's money and success, yeah. cockroaches come. Um, mm -hmm feed on poor entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, no, it's very sad. I, I've heard, you know, they're, they're accelerators and they, you know, they just take a 10% of your company, they don't give you any money, they don't give you any work in space, but they give you their approval logo. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, great. A and mentorship. And mentorship, it's very, very dangerous. And I'm, I used to be a mentor, and I'm, I'm a mentor, but I'm a very, very weird mentor. The problem with the mentors is that you go with all your know-how and all your experience in your sector, and you sit down for one, two hours with a group of people, and they tell you about their business model, and you say, of course, you have to do this, 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 in your experience. And then these four people that have been working on their startup for days, hours, years, they say, okay, if this person says it, we're gonna try it. The mentor has no fucking idea of, you know, what the what problems they the one hour, two hours is not enough. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to to be a good mentor. And help and be able to, to really help. I think another thing is an advisor. Because mentor is like a holistic thing that he's the guy who's gonna tell you how to raise a lot of, if that guy really knew how to do it, he will be doing it, not mentoring you. <laughs> <laughs> really. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing is an advisor, you know, that you need help with a specific thing. For example, Sector. now I'm getting advisors on how insurance company works. So I'm looking for a guy who knows a lot of insurance companies and that person is helping us with his specific know-how. But I'm pro-advisors, anti-mentors. Mm. And all the mentors hate me a lot. <laughs> 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 okay, so I forgot to tell you, but this is in May is the um, women, uh, the female entrepreneur month, and mm -hmm. uh, actually startup brand all over the world is dedicating this month interviewing all and women. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why we invited Itsanami. That actually it's a, a really good uh, yeah. example of uh, women in career uh, with with a kid. So. I want you to know what you do. You think being a woman affected uh, in some way your career or not at all? Uh, I do know for women that I know that work in another sectors that it the workforce is not equal enough. For example, in Spain, they don't get equal payment, they don't get equal opportunities. But as I've only worked, you know, in in, in startup business, in the startup business, you know, in my experience, I've never, ever, ever been discriminated for being a woman. I've been positively discriminated, and I've been invited to things uh, like, ah, oh, we have a panel, but they're all men, so we would love you to come, so we have a women, and it was like, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for evaluating my, you know, my know-how. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm here because I have boobs. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, you know, those things also give visibility and help and, and stuff, but I, I truly believe that in the startup sector there is no discrimination at all. No, but still there are not so many found female founders in Spain, we can say. Yeah, because uh, that's delicate because in my opinion what you need to be a good entrepreneur is to have a good education and you know, to be bold enough and, and a bit crazy. That's my personal opinion. And then go do it. And in Spain, you know, 
there are countries in the world that they kill girls for going to school. And in Spain, we are lucky enough to have a fantastic and equalitarian educational system. And in fact, we have more, uh, more women with degree than men. Mm -hmm. Why they don't launch startups? No idea. We're qualified enough to do it. So if they don't, maybe it's a cultural thing, maybe... Yeah, it's tough, it's time consuming. If you have a family, kids, probably it's not that easy, it's risky. I disagree there also. Because at the end, now that I have it here, <laughs> you know, the only two things that I'm, I, I need to do by myself is to grow this, my husband can do it, <laughs> and to breastfeed him. But after the breastfeeding is complete, he's capable enough also to go pick him up from school, mm -hmm. go to the partner's meet. So my career shouldn't suffer more than his career. Mm -hmm. So at the end, I think it's more of a private matter of how you negotiate and how you evaluate things with your partner than saying, no, we, you know, the government must do something. The government can't rule how you share responsibilities with your partner. So yeah. it, I think it's more of a cultural thing, and we all have the responsibility to to put our careers in value. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, my career is equally important with my husband's career. So I'm not going to allow him to say, no, you're the woman. You have to pick up the kids from school every day. Excuse me? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you, know, you know how to drive, too? So that's the only skill you need to pick up kids from school. Yeah. So I... I truly believe that you know this is not going to affect at all. Okay. So, but okay. So, you uh, how many months? Uh, eight. Eight. So it's yeah. almost. It's almost here. So okay. So you have to take <laughs> like at least few months now or break. Actually, mm, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you you want to <laughs> see how if you feel well yeah. you're gonna do it. it right? It's like this is an, a startup itself. You know, <laughs> in in fact they say hey, I've launched a startup. This couldn't be so hard. Next scene, Ethan, I'm in September crying. Shit, this is so hard. I don't <laughs> know. No idea. But um, I'm feeling great, so I really expect to keep working while I'm feeling great. And after, it all depends on him. If he's a nice boy who sleeps a lot and doesn't cry, then I will be able to to go back to the office really soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really lucky because when you're an entrepreneur, you have a flexibility that a person who works for a big company doesn't have. So I can work from anywhere in Madrid or in the world. I can work from home. I can take the baby to the office. And I don't know. We have a pet-friendly office, so <laughs> now we can make a baby-friendly office <laughs> if he doesn't cry. He cries a lot, then he will have to stay at home and meet with him. So, no idea. It's an startup. Okay, I have to validate it. Okay. So uh, the last part. There are a few questions that we mm -hmm. normally do to everyone that are more okay. technical, to like about the tools you use and stuff. Mm -hmm. So there is like any tools that you use every day that it's like uh, that you cannot live without. Yes. Not say email. Um, <laughs> first of all, Spotify. <laughs> The day I forget my earplugs at home, I go back and grab them because I'm unable to work without music. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like an addiction I have. Uh, then Slack. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I want to write them an email or something. If Slack had a video chat, it will be like, like perfect. It will be. It will, it will be. be great. Uh, yeah, yeah. What? Yes, yeah. please. No, you need to. And um, I also use Trello a lot to organize everything. Gmail, of course. And I think that's that's it. Okay. Yeah. And there is someone that it's for you like a role model, like someone that you really admire in like an entrepreneur or or yes. also not? Um Amancio Ortega. Why? Uh, because uh, I'm a bit critical with all the unicorn scalability thing. And, you know, to me, playing that game is like playing poker. 
and doing real business as they have been done for a very, very long time is like playing chess. So, you know, if I, if I had to choose a career, I would definitely would love to have a career like Amancio Ortega mm -hmm. than, you know, creating a Silicon Valley unicorn with a valuation of two billion euros and then sell it and make a lot of millions and then, you know, take pictures of myself in Instagram with Moe Shandong. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm taking it to this stream, mm -hmm. but at the end, you know, uh, we have an amazing advisor at Doctor24 and she used to be the managing director of Indra, which is mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest uh, consulting. Uh, and I asked her the other day, Emma, what's Indra's valuation? And she told me one, mil one billion dollar, uh, euros. And I was like, there are 200, 300 companies, Silicon Valley, some of them they have never ever made one single dollar of revenue. And they have the same valuation of a company, you know, with actives, buildings, contracts. So I don't know, I think something is broken. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I want to Big be bubble. <laughs> Amancio Ortega, <laughs> not, I don't know, any founder of any unicorn that mm -hmm. doesn't have a business model yet. Okay. Uh, there is any book, this is a question that everybody has, but uh, we have to, to ask you. There is any book that uh, you really like that would you suggest? Uh, I'm reading uh, Focus from Daniel Goleman. This guy is a neuroscientist and he really explains to you how your subconscious and conscious work and how your you know, brain works. And it's really helpful to cure this illness of constant information. We all have like TDA syndrome all the time. You know, you need to check on Instagram and then Facebook. And so it, it, it's really helping me to be able to stay Focus. and do the same thing for one hour without checking Facebook. It's amazing. And mindfulness also. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, you, you can tell it by my name, but my parents, they are both hippies, like real hippies. I didn't eat any meat until I was 18. Oh, wow. Well. That, that's where the yoga comes from, and mm -hmm. that's why I'm called Ithanami. So, uh, so I'm, I've been meditating for, for a long time. Now it's called mindfulness. Yeah, what it's is like meditation? Yeah, it's like growth hacking. <laughs> it's a very cool Putting world, cool names but in <laughs> Spain it's buscarse las papas, you know, you know something like that. So <laughs> now it's like mindfulness, uh, but yeah, that, that helps a lot also. Um, okay, so... L Last last thing, it's uh, which kind of advice would you like to give to these people that probably are starting their project? So as entrepreneurs and then as women okay. entrepreneurs. As entrepreneurs, what I was uh, saying before, like get sure, really, really sure and validate until you get crazy that the idea you have really solves a problem that a lot of people have or little people with a lot of money. But you know, you have to you need to have your first first paycheck there and go for it from the very first start. And to women entrepreneurs I will say the exact same thing. Uh, you know, it's 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 the only advice I think you need, either you are a woman or or a man. We don't need any differentiate. No, no, no. Maybe to to nice. invite them to be to to go against the risk and not don't be of course uh, you know we're exactly equipped equipped like men you know we have the same capabilities and I don't believe that we are exact the same equal and we think the same way but I do think that that's a good thing you know it's the same like if you're from Asia you have another baggage because you have another culture so you know. Mm -hmm and Asian people is capable, like Spanish people, to launch startups. So women and men are equally capable too. Okay. So now it's your turn. So uh, you can make any questions you want to Itsanami. Shoot. Caroline. <laughs> Ça va. <laughs> Do you have a microphone? So when you were talking about your uh, business plan, 
for um, for Caliedes. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised because you know we always say uh, don't spend time in uh, doing a business plan. Would you recommend uh, to someone who starts to actually do this business plan? I will recommend to do it and then spread it. But the the exercise of putting thing in an Excel really makes you realize things that you probably didn't thought before, like cash flow. Cash flow is a very, very important thing, and there are companies that die because of cash flow. And if you're not, if you don't have a lot of experience, you, it's something that you don't think about. So when you start to put in an Excel, okay, the money is going to come in this time, but I need to pay salaries, so you know what I do here. Doing an Excel and doing a business plan really helps you figure that out. Things are evolving because like five years ago, almost every VC in Spain will ask you of a seven years projection. <laughs> Don't know, even if you're know if you going to make any money. Uh, right now, they ask you for six months, one year, which is something I think reasonable. It's, it's a it's a very nice exercise to do, to realize. Okay, so what I found interesting about your story is that you come from a very different background from, from since when you, since your study mm -hmm. and when you en where you ended up in health. In health. So what is your opinion in the in the subject? Does it help to to work in something that you have studied? I think it does because when sometimes innocence and being naive uh helps coming up with disruptive solutions. When you when you don't know how things are made and when you do you know about traditions or bureaucracy or things, your brain is able to come up with more efficient solutions because you're not conditionated with that. But even though you do need to find advisors then to validate your crazy ideas because I think that naiveness helps you to generate a lot of ideas that are very disruptive and very cool, but not all of them can be executed. And then that's where, you know, the advisors or hiring the best team possible helps to make things make things happen. So it's not a it's not a bad idea then, but you need some advisors af after you have started your project so they can guide you in that sense. Advisors or it, it in my case, it's, uh, it's advisors because it's a very complicated market, but what you really, really need is the customer to buy it. That's what you need. And the real advisor and the real validator is, is your customer. So any idea that you have, what you need to do is to take it to the customer as soon as possible, before that you have invested hours and millions on developing it, and to see if the customer buys it or not. And depending on that, you can you can work. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, I've got one question. Um, so you raised 40,000? 40, 40,000? Yeah. Um, could your business have worked if you raised no money? And how do you feel about raising money as a validation method? Wow, that's a great question. Um, okay. If we hadn't, if we hadn't raised any money, we should have um, compatibilized it with our works. So, you know, um, that's, that's something tricky because there's another question there, which is, should an entrepreneur ask for a salary? Um, my answer is hell yes, because you're working at the end. And the problem is that if you don't, investors get used that entrepreneurs, they don't make any money, they eat air, and they live with their parents, and that makes that only people with a high income can become an entrepreneur. So in my case, if I hadn't raised any money, 
I could not ever leave my work, so those three months should have been six, eight, ten months. I don't know if we could have lost the opportunity, maybe, but you know, until we we started to make, I don't know, probably six months after launching with the money that we were making at the time, then we could have started leaving from the project. But uh, I don't know, we couldn't reach that. And uh, the second part, where is, um, would you say that the money validated the business? Yes, um, that's a problem. And, and that's something that is happening that I, I do. I do not agree with it, but I'm not, uh, I'm no one to judge it. But in my case, my work as a CEO for three years and a half was to raise money and was to increase the validation of the startup as much as possible. Only at the end, my work started to be to raise the revenue. Only at the end. My work was to raise the valuation, do things that raise the valuation. How much money are you making? Doesn't matter, just raise the valuation. And as I said before, I think it's not a sustainable game. But it's true, you know, for example, one, <coughs> we raised 750, uh, 750, 100,000 euros, more or less because one competitor in France got bought by Offermanin, Offermanin, <laughs> she's French, and my French is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for 70 million euros. So the pitch was easy. Hey, these guys in France got, s got bought by 70 million euros. We are in six countries. When we got bought, we was going to be like 200 millions. Give me the money. And it worked. It, it was not about metrics. It was, uh, we had metrics and we had stuff, but you know that the, the USP was, was that one. So. Um, I have a second yeah. question. <laughs> um, what are some validation techniques that you say are very transferable to other industries? Um, another tool, Typeform, for example, it's their Spanish, by the way, and it's an online service, like Google um, questions, but it's responsive, you can put videos, and it looks really, really nice. Um, use your social media, create a Typeform with questions, and you know, spread the word, and, and, and ask, 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 ask. If you have to go to the street, go to the street. You know, uh, uh, we've done everything. We've done focus groups, we have done type forms. Um, and if, as soon as you can get an, because also people, it's like uh, when they do in interviews and they say, what is the program that you say? Everyone watch documentaries. And then <laughs> Salva is the most watched program in Spain, you know, so the, best validation possible is when you're able to get money from the customer. The, the other validations are orientative, but the real deal is when, is this guy ready to pay you for your product or not? That's the validation. Hi, Tanami. Hola. Um, I'm very interested in uh, personal development, mm -hmm. and um, when you mentioned that you opened uh, six offices, started companies, hire people in different countries, um, that must have met many challenges, feelings. Uh, um, what are some of the experiences that most impacted you and uh, some of the learnings that you took from those? That, that, uh, that's also a great question. Um, the most impacting things were firing people, that's, you, you never get, u get used to that. Uh, but the first person you have to fire is like, I spent two weeks with cramps in my stomach, not being able to sleep. I postponed the decision for almost four months. And it wasn't, because she was a, she was a single mother, she was an orphan, you know, it was like the worst case scenario <laughs> and, and it was feeling like, oh my God, I'm firing her. You know, she's, she has a little <laughs> girl. She has no parents. She moved from 
one city from Rome to where we had the offices in Italy, and she had no friends, no support, not anything, and it was going to fire her, and it was like a really bad person. And I tried to move her all around the organization, giving her another roles and trying shit. And then one day I realized that if I didn't fire her, we will all get out of business in one month. So it was like, okay, her or 15 people. That made the decision easy. But it, it does get easier, but it's never, an, well, I enjoyed one, one firing, the only one. <laughs> she was a bitch, <laughs> you know, she was like, oh my God. But the other ones are, it, it's, it's always hard. And you, I think what I'm biggest learning was that, uh, this is, uh, shit, this is going to sound really cheesy, <laughs> to believe Say. in myself. It must have, but uh, we had a lot of problems with in some investors and some people that come to you with a lot of experience, 40, 50 years, with a lot of money, and they tell you, no, things work this way, you have to do things that way. And you say, you look at yourself and say, of course, you know, you, you're the boss, you know how to do things, you're really experienced, and when you realize that you should have heard your gut, it's like, okay, next time I better, you know, don't be so quick on silencing your voice and saying, no, no, this guy is older, he knows what he's saying. Like, trust yourself. Y you know why you're feeling that and you know why you think that. Mainly, it's not that you're more smart than that guy, but you have spent the last thousand hours thinking on your product and he just s has has spent two hours so that would have fixed me a lot of situation lots of it Thank you. you're welcome Do we have another question? you want it no. <laughs> you change idea <laughs> So the first company you you started it with your um, you're with your husband of the mm -hmm. moment. And this you started it also with uh, someone else. What no. do you I know you started it alone? I I'm I'm a happy uh intrapreneur. Uh -huh. But mm, that that that's another learning, you know. Do not hire your friends ever. Mm -hmm. Ever. Your husband, less. <laughs> less. Well, I, that's tricky because I do know uh, couples of entrepreneurs that work great. In our case, it didn't work, but we're still very good friends, and we were able to keep working together after getting a divorce. So in our case, working together did m made a difference, but you never know. But with friends, it's like clear, because this is going to sound bad, but information is power, and your best friend mm. has a lot of information of you that if you one day have to need to go there and say, hey, uh, you're not working hard enough, or you need to tell that person something that that person is not going to like to hear, they have a lot of things to fight back with, and it's, 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 it's very hard. Do you have any tip in in finding the the right uh, partner? The right partner. Uh, uh, yeah. Find someone. Co-founder. Co uh, find uh, someone who's ideally smarter than you, like really, really smart, and really, really good at what he does, and very different of you. Because when it works, great, it's when, for example, Ramon and I, it didn't work in a personal way, but as co-founders, we were great. Because he hated my job, and I hated his job. <laughs> and that's perfect. Because then you don't overlap, and you don't, he does his job, you trust that person, he's doing a great job, but you never, we didn't have to make joint decisions, very, very less. So. Find someone who hates your job, <laughs> whose <laughs> job you hate, and who's smarter than you, and probably it will work great. 
Any other question? Okay, so if I would like to know if there is any women here that it's starting a project. I would like to do like a pitch elevator to Itsanami. Yes, I love pitches. Caro, yeah. Dina. <laughs> Bueno, so the pitch is, uh, first, I would like to ask you if you or do you have any friends who do have a job but who feel frustrated in their jobs? Yes, okay, great. And in general, what do they do? Consulting. <laughs> <laughs> Consulting and to help, what do they do? They do nothing about their, or do they do something to help them create a new job? LinkedIn. LinkedIn? Okay. Great. So I've been talking, so I, I work now in a business school. I run a program of entrepreneurship and what I like most about uh, my students, that many of them have worked uh, at Thunderbox, is that at the end of the four months they really know themselves better and they really know what they want to do in life and that really is my biggest uh, achievement when it, uh, when it comes true. And lately I have a lot of friends, so I'm 27, and a lot of friends who are working at L'Oréal, at uh, Google, uh, BCG, and they have great salaries, but they just are bored in their jobs. And many of them, I've been helping them, like in talking to them a lot, and some of them I've done the jump and some not. So what I want to do is to create a, um, a way to help these people to actually create the new professional projects that really fulfill them mm -hmm. through uh, collective experiences, through a community that supports them and through methodologies related to coaching, to psychology and entrepreneurship. So this is the pitch. <laughs> That I'm really at the beginning, but if you have any <laughs> feedback. Um, I think you it identified a problem that, it, that is there. Mm -hmm. And the big question will be how you will monetize it. Mm -hmm. Because I, I do believe that that's a problem that, that exists. I've experienced it with friends. And in my experience, I know that when you take someone and you coach them and you push them a little bit, if they're ready, they do jump and then they're very happy that mm -hmm. they've jumped. Um, but I, I guess that there's a lot of work still on the product that will be the solution to mm -hmm. that problem. Yes. But uh, this is like, I, I know her from before and I, I know you can, you're very good at this mm -hmm. thing. You know, she has the best students ever. If you need mm. great students for your startups, <laughs> speak with okay. Caroline. Like amazing, amazing, and, and, and you have the know-how of how make people great and find their passion. Mm. So you have the skills, you have identified a problem, you now to need to find how to make money out of mm. it. Yes. 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 Because for the moment, the only way to make money, that's why I was asking you for the business plan, is I want to launch like some trainings uh, immersive mm -hmm. in a, like a format of weekends, you know, like super intensivos. But uh, pff, the money is like uh, just um, enough to pay uh, the experts, uh, mm -hmm. the Casa Rural, and nothing more at the moment. So <laughs> There's a lot of uh, big companies wanting to lavar la cara helping entrepreneurs mm. and probably there's a lot of money there like mm. if you go like hi i have a project for entrepreneurs uh we can put your logo in our things and maybe that's a way to start yes. monetizing that okay thank, thank you, you. so thank you. another one thank you very much Oops, sorry but basically the question is the same basically mm -hmm. so i'm not really money driven but I have mm -hmm. to live from something. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how to combine these two ideas just yet. So at the moment, I'm just more like uh, developing the idea. And um, I would like to achieve some um, social change. Mm -hmm. So what it's yeah. about? Uh, it's about uh, La Colmena que dice que si. This is like the... Oh, sorry, I didn't... It's, it's a French startup. 
Mm -hmm. It's um, it's an online platform where you buy um, products directly, um, food products directly from producers, from the farmers. Mm -hmm. And this way you um, omit the um, middlemen, the supermarkets. And um, it is a social change because there's um, a lot of abuse in the agriculture sector and uh, um, and I've been following the farmers' lives and attending many talks and and um, I think it's a great idea. But it, it is, and I I I do know that if it's well executed, there is money there. there in Spain, there are four or five startups doing the same thing, and they they're making money. I'm I'm a customer. And do you know anybody? <laughs> well, do you know any uh, social entrepreneur? Um, uh, well, in in this case, they don't consider this themselves social entrepreneurs. They're just yeah, I know, yeah. But uh, this is my personal sort of like I would <laughs> maybe like to start there and then move on on different projects. But um, yes. So, so the question is, is yeah, if I know here, uh, if you know any social entrepreneurship, and um, um, I do know uh, one related with fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called uh, the the I O U project. And they, you know, they build gar garments in India with fair salaries. And the cool thing is that in every garment, it's unique because the waivers they do the, the waves differently. And they have a, a code, a BD code on the on the etiqueta, and you just have to scan it, and then you see the picture of the guy who made your clothes, and you can chat with him. And it's 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 very cool. The clothes are cool, also. The wedges are are fair, and it has that edgy hipster thing that you can speak with the guy who made your clothes. And but it's a social entrepreneurship. But they make a lot of money. They you know they they make less money than Amancio Ortega because they have less margins, but they do live from it and they live very very well. So. That kind of social entrepreneurship, you're selling things, and when you're selling things, getting a commission is not unfair. You know, you're doing a job too, and it's easy to monetize, I think. Thank yeah, you. another one. <laughs> I can uh, speak Spanish? Sure. Sure? Okay. Yes? Okay. Sí. Well, um, bueno, primero que todo, discúlpame por haber llegado fuera de la hora. Nada. <risa> eh, casualmente salí de mi trabajo a las 7 y 30 y yo dije, bueno, iba a ir a hacer ejercicio en el retiro, pero eh, me abrí la página de campus.co y resulta que estaba tu ponencia. Eh, yo tengo un proyecto también de salud, una uh -huh. startup, eh, justamente se llama misgalenos.com y la verdad... Desconozco lo que es Doctor 24, <risa> pero me voy a atrever a decirlo porque, a ver, solo cuando vi el título de la ponencia me vine corriendo, en serio, <risa> me vine corriendo. Gracias. Y bueno, eh, me han dicho que confíe en que puedo decir en mi speech. <risa> claro. <risa> ok, eh, bueno, mi sistema es en principio un buscador, un uh -huh. buscador de profesionales de la salud donde se puede ubicar un médico, un especialista, a través de eh, escribiendo solamente la especialidad, la ubicación o eh, especial ubicación o el nombre de la persona. Esto arrojaría un resultado según la base de datos que esté en el sistema. Vale. Adicional a esto, bueno, la persona podría simplemente contactar, hacer una reserva de cita, eh, de consulta, que esto pues... También su, los datos van en la nube, sincronizado con el sistema que ya tiene el, el médico en su consultorio. Además, el, la idea para la idea trata en función es globalizar el tema de la comunicación de salud, de la salud, de nuestra historia clínica. Hay muchos estudios y se está haciendo actualmente lo que es la historia clínica digital, la historia médica digital. Pero yo pienso que se pierden datos y se pierden datos porque con el tema de la tendencia al turismo médico, eh, la idea es centralizarlo de alguna forma y que la gente pueda compartir esa historia eh, cuando, se, cuando están tra siendo tratados en un país uh -huh. hasta otro país. En el entendido que tiene que haber una legislación de por medio, lógicamente, para allá vamos, pero de eso se trata, ¿no? de, de hacer... Eh, de hacer este mundo mejor. 
De hecho, mi propuesta de valor es que eh, tener salud es ser feliz. Si no tenemos salud, pues no podemos ser felices. Necesitamos de esa, de esa salud, de esa pasión para poder pues, todos los días hacer las cosas que nos gustan. Vivir. Y el tema de tener a un médico las 24 horas uh -huh. disponible a ese, eh, a, con solo esa conexión a internet, eh, que bueno, que actualmente es, es un servicio básico. Si no tenemos internet, pues no existimos. <risa> Así es fácil. Entonces, conectarnos y que el paciente y el mismo médico tenga la posibilidad de compartir esa información, esa data, uh -huh. con el otro profesional que está del otro lado del mundo o al consultorio de al lado. Vale. Precisamente para eso. ¿Y contesta en inglés o en español? ¿Da igual? Sí. Vale. A ese ¿Hay punto alguien que en no español, español para... <risa> ok. ¿Hay answer in English? ¿Es that fine? Yes, but this is my traductor. <laughs> vale. Vale, hago un mix. Vale, genial. Uh, ok, vale. Hay, okay. Hay, hay como dos partes en, en lo que me has contado. Está una parte que es la de encontrar médicos y agendar online, que ahí tendrías que tener una propuesta muy diferencial sí. para compartir con Doctor Alia, What Clinic, Salud Net. O sea, Correcto. hay mucha gente ya que tiene. Competencia. A, a todos los médicos literalmente de España en, en, en su base de datos ya subidos. Entonces, ahí lo veo que está como, como muy maduro. Sin embargo, en Latinoamérica es un, verga, un mercado muy virgen. Por ejemplo. Okay. O sea que Yo lo tengo en Venezuela y funciona. Fe, funciona perfectamente en Venezuela. Y podría decirte, no soy la primera, pero sí estamos en este, una competencia muy, muy reñida. Ahí, ahí sí. O sea, ahí ahí no, no, te lo, no, no, te lo, no te lo peleo. Y la parte del, del, del historial único es el sueño dorado. O sea, ah. llevan en Estados Unidos desde 1946. <risa> en, en España se está luchando muchísimo, lo llaman la carpeta única de salud. Sí. Pero para que te hagas una idea, por ejemplo, en España tenemos 17 sistemas sanitarios diferentes. La tarjeta de Andalucía no te sirve en Madrid, por ejemplo, sanitaria. Es, es un cacao... De hecho, justo hoy eh, en la oficina estábamos hablando de, oye, ¿cómo se podría resolver el, el, el problema de la tarjeta sanitaria? Y la respuesta es un holocausto zombie que acabase con todo lo que hay, toda la burocracia, todo tal, y empezar de cero. Sería casi claro. más fácil que… O sea, yo, es algo que se tiene que poder solucionar. No, no sé cómo. Eh, alguien encontrará la respuesta y la persona que lo haga… Va a ser el dios de la medicina, <risa> va a ser el Steve Jobs de la telemedicina, yeah. pero es un reto brutal, o sea, brutal. Que además va a impactar muy positivamente porque sí. las estadísticas sí. de negligencias relacionadas con que el médico no, no sabe. tuvo la información de este tío, o sea, pero cosas tan básicas como que igual llegas a urgencias y nadie sabe cuál es tu mm, grupo sanguíneo. Claro. Uh -huh. Y entre que lo descubren... Ya no te ponen la transfusión y te sí. mueres. Y eso Incluso el paciente pasa. miente o se le olvida. O, o no lo sabe. También, o no hecho. lo sabe. Ay, ¿puedo aprovechar para hacer una encuesta? Claro. ¿Cuántos de vosotros sabéis vuestro grupo sanguíneo? Sí. Do you know your blood uh, group? <risa> vale. He perdido una apuesta. Sí. <risa> we, we were at the office today and they were saying, no one knows the, the blood group. And it was like, You have, you know it. I know mine. See, that's another example of my way of thinking is not universal, and it's no one knows there. You know that's very dangerous, right? If you're about to die, you need to know your blood group. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very important thing. It's yeah. I I lost. <laughs> thank okay. You. So thank you very much for You're coming. Welcome. Uh, was great to have you.